I don't know how you are with this stuff, Matt, but when I start like thinking about things, I end up having like, I end up talking to myself basically. Maybe it's a <laughs> part of living alone, yep. but I'm sitting yeah. at my computer, like go like basically ranting. And I'm like, wait, I should be doing this to somebody <laughs> at <laughs> least like getting it out there. And, uh, you know, at least, I, and then hey, I can get some feedback on whether I'm way off base or not. And, <laughs> and it, it's, not just me talking to myself so uh -huh. thanks for taking the time I'm yeah um i'm here for you so um <laughs> so opportunity costs now he, he brings this oh. up um and i think you know we you know we kind of touched on it he brings it up as like you know kind of a a first approximation for how you might want to wait hours uh in a co-op um but the only type of opportunity cost that I, I believe, and I would have to go back and make sure I'm not, I didn't miss something, but it really, it seemed like, you know, when you talk about the opportunity cost, it's the opportunity cost of working in the co-op versus working in a traditional business where you, in the capitalist economy, where depending on who you are and what your skills are, you may get a higher um, wage rate or, you know, some level of remuneration. Mm. Um, and that the opportunity cost then of working in the worker co-op is the difference between what you can make in the worker co-op and what you could make in the capitalist economy, right? But there's also opportunity cost that goes the other way that often gets neglected. And I you know, don't think is really um, taken into account enough or as much as I would like to see in the chapter, which is the opportunity cost of working in the traditional economy and everything that you give up working in a capitalist corporate you know, business oh, yeah. versus working in a cooperative, right? Being treated as an object and an expense by your employer. Um, yeah. Your work and your talents and your time being used to benefit uh, employers who are oppressive and exploitative, maybe not of you, but of other people. Um, that's the opportunity cost. That's what you have to pay in order to, you know, that's what you give up to work in the in the capitalist economy versus working in the co-op and that has a value as well um, but again mm. it's something it's a type of value that is difficult to put a financial amount on it's very easy to say well i could make x dollars in the traditional economy and y dollars in the co-op and then we do some math and that's easy um, this kind of thing you can't put a dollar value on however i did mm. um, with the help of malakia uh, johnson a couple of years ago do a little experiment just a not really or, uh so she was down in california in the bay area and wanted to go visit the arizmendi bakeries as you do when you're a co-op person in san francisco <laughs> of course you go to every arizmendi bakery you can <laughs> um, and so she went to several of them um and interviewed people only recorded interviews with you know, whoever was, you know, whatever member was around that had, you know, time to, you know, sit there on their lunch break and, and chat with her. And um, when she was preparing to do this, we were talking and she was saying, you know, what kind of, what kind of questions, you know, should I ask? And the only question I had for her was, would somebody have to capitalist business again like you know comes you know their headhunter comes and says hey we want you to work in our bakery and we're going to pay you this much how, how much would that number have to be to draw you away from errors mm. <laughs> the answers i think are very very you know enlightening um okay. very it, they ranged anywhere from the only person who, I think who actually gave a number, it was like four or five times what she was making at Arismendi. And she's like, and nobody pays that like, like that. Right. It's not a thing. So I, <laughs> and everybody else said, there is no amount. Like, are you kidding me? Go back to that. No. <laughs> right. We're, we're doing okay. Like people's, our needs are being met. I'm not suffering here. And there's no amount of money you could pay me, you know, that would offset that opportunity cost of working in a capitalist business, right? And so yeah. I think that that's another important thing to take into account that it's not just, you know, working in the co-op is not just you giving up, you know, something in terms of, you know, monetary compensation that might be available other uh, someplace else. 
it's also getting things that are incredibly valuable. But again, there are these kind of human <laughs> values that that don't have uh, market prices. And so I think for that reason, end up getting devalued when we're thinking about this kind of stuff. So that's my first uh, thought. Just throw it out there for you. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I love it. Um, well, in terms of Rosetto stuff, he doesn't go on about it, but he definitely mentions this. So he definitely says there are specific reasons why you would prefer to work in a co-op that are not, uh, accounted for this and control over your work freedom i forget what, what they're right. there's like three things i think he lists and he does it maybe once or twice in the chapter makes reference to that but he doesn't go into it in any depth but it's not like he's not aware of that or doesn't think it's important so that's yeah. so it's there you know whether it should be feature bigger maybe whether he should make more out right. of it's an interesting question i also think another way to look at this is he, at, at a number of times in the book, he he is careful to specify. He's like, look, when you're talking about cooperatives, you're talking about something that is inherently social, political, cultural, economic. You're not just talking about an economic form. You're talking about something that in its nature is all of these things. And so he says, mm -hmm. in this book, we're talking about the economic aspect. But mm -hmm. that doesn't, that's not to suggest that co-ops don't have these other aspects and that those other mm. aspects aren't actually important and even decisive, right? Like they're, those are the, you know, we don't, you don't just do it for economic, so-called economic reasons, mm -hmm. right? But that's, if you look at it that way, you're being way too economistic in looking at co-ops. Co-ops are not, uh, they are inherently social, political. And I would say, you know, obviously that's true in a different way of capitalist firms. It's just that the mm -hmm. particular social, political, cultural aspect of theirs puts the economy at the center and makes all these other things unimportant. <clears throat> but that's like the specific sort of culture of capitalism. But the co-op culture is different. And so, mm -hmm. so in the book, mm -hmm. by focusing on the economic, he's kind of, it's possible to draw the conclusion. It's possible to draw the wrong conclusion from that, which is that he's making a sort of traditional argument about the role of the economy or the way to think about the economy, or the economic aspects of co-ops. So I sure. think it's, a, yeah. so I think for that reason, it's like, so that's why when I read this book, I feel like it's good to read it. It's good to read it against the background of other things he's written. So like the two other things mm -hmm. that are on the geo site are useful that way because they bring out more the social political sort of cultural aspects and that's important to keep in mind because otherwise yeah a lot of this book can end up sounding like he is just sort of talking about the economy as if co-ops were simply businesses right even though he's using these very mm -hmm. different concepts and very different framings it can sound like it's the same thing so i would say in addition to that i'm not sure that applying the term opportunity cost to social political and cultural uh, factors is that is necessarily a good decision. Like mm. that's what you do when you're stuck mm. with economics and you have to try to account for these other social political things that are excluded. So there's a tendency to try to stretch the economic categories to include these other things. But I'm not sure that you know opportunity cost. I think it's helpful to think of it in a pretty narrow. He's using it in a in a sense in a pretty narrow economic sense. And I don't think that's a bad thing because it doesn't mean that he's not aware of the other factors. It's like he's it's not like he doesn't think that there's a value to being working in cooperatives that isn't accounted for by right. straight, straight up, up Should that value though? I guess the question is for me, should that value that is not accounted for in this in his very yeah. narrow uh, conception of opportunity costs and and how labor should be weighted to account for those? Like should should the should it play into that? Should it play into those final numbers? Oh, okay, right? yeah. 
that I guess that is where I, I like I think there's a missing connection. And, and, and I, you know, of course yeah. I have, you know, read the other things that, you know, uh, that, that he's written um, on the site and that's, right. you know, it's, it's good. And, and for, you know, in some ways I've been a little bit surprised, especially after reading like Solidarity Economy Roads and stuff that's so, you know, seems like a lot more radical in a lot of ways. And then like, you know, and then, you know, how to create a solidarity enterprise, which of course is, you know, just more of a practical guide, but still like a very radical, type, you know, guide for, for starting a, a business or any type of enterprise. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, reading, you know, uh, you know, this chapter, and I've been, you know, super impressed with everything up to this and, you know, really, you know, appreciate this as well. But it's it, like, I feel like there's this kind of disconnect mm. where it's like, yes there like we can like uh, state or acknowledge that there are these other aspects of the co-op and there's the economic aspect and there's the social and this but really in reality all those categories we just make up in our heads for the purposes of analysis the co-op is one unified thing and you cannot separate out the economic part from the social yeah. part from anything else and so it, it, to my mind, it all has to kind of play into how the economic aspect works, the purely economic aspect. And so I guess like yeah. if I were to, you know, if I were Rosetto's editor or something or, or, or co-writer and like giving feedback on like, okay, how to improve this chapter, I would think mm. like, okay, or just like the, the concept in general, it'd be like, all right, so like, does it philosophically, to me, it's, it seems like that part of determining how this weighting should be is taking account of the fact that there are lots of non-monetizable non-monetary benefits that you receive from working at the co-op that yeah. you know need to be taken into account when we're saying like how much more should an hour of your time be counted versus an hour of somebody else's time right yeah. Um, yeah, I think I would probably agree with that. I mean, I feel like I, like we said before, I had the similar reaction to the fact that he mentioned contributions to the C factor, and then they're not, they don't show up in the weighting right. of any of these pay things. Yeah. That is, uh, you know, there are different ways to think about how to resolve that. But I do feel like mm -hmm. it would be a stronger book if that there was some, if that was addressed. <laughs> like sure. if that, I'd be happier when I'm reading that right. chapter if that piece didn't feel like it was missing, right? Which is, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying, is like, it feels sure. like there's something missing here. Why, where is that? Um, and I think this one, I mean, yeah, I think also this is another case where it would be stronger if there was, if this were addressed. Like again, brought up, brought forward. Like if we just did yeah. more with it, like said, well. You know, even like a, I don't know what, like another passage, a little pull out box that says, hey, for you readers who are concerned about this thing, because yeah, yeah. it's logical that his, that you and I or, are having or, a reaction that a lot of people would have, because it's just kind of video of, of two guys talking about it. <laughs> there you go. Right. You got to add that in. I, but, I don't want to be overly critical, though. I don't, you know, I, it, 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 yeah. I you know, I don't want to have the do the typical criticism of well you didn't write the book that i would have written yeah right, 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 right. you didn't write the book you, know, you, you didn't yeah. address the thing in you know things that you're not trying to address here right um and so you know the, the i think the great value in this is really like just mm. really trying to at least think very um explicitly about these things in a kind of you know pretty deep way and at least kind of sh showing some of the pathways like okay you didn't end up walking down all of them maybe as for yeah far as we would have liked but we can do that now you know yeah. and it's like even if unfortunately the c factor didn't make it into his list of uh, skills that you can bring to a co-op uh, that might require some extra remuneration um Mm -hmm. He did mention it, and we can like see that yeah. and and add that in. Uh, very, you know, useful. Even if you know, we've got some. I've got some nitpicks um, here and there, and but uh, you know, many of them may just be, hey, you didn't write the book that I would have written. <laughs> no, I think I think everything you're saying makes total sense, and I think it is. I what impresses me, like 
so I have two sort of feelings as I go through this book. One feeling is I'm just really impressed at the uh, chutzpah to like, because he's not a trained economist even, right? Like he studied economics, but he's a very unusual bird. Like he's, he's, this is not coming from an academic economist. This is, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's an, uh, he's got a very unusual trajectory. He and, is an academic though, right? I mean. Well, not really because oh. he, so he, so. I thought he was he a professor. Was, kind of. So what happened is he's, you know, he, he's seized during the coup in Chile. He's released. He goes into exile. Um, mm -hmm. Goes to Italy. In Italy, he studies Gramsci. Goes into this huge Gramsci phase, and and with this other guy Pasquale Misuraka, he, he writes like three books, which are all based on Gramsci. It's like this very. He, he just goes way, way, way into uh, to Gramsci, and I think it's called like you know path to another world or something. I forget what it is. It's a, it's all about sort of social transformation from a Gramscian point view and then he ends up going back eventually to chile which i guess you could do in the eight sometime in the 80s it became possible to go back i forget the dates but late 80s maybe but um and then gets involved in um research sort of research and organizing especially around popular economy through the through catholic church backed organizations mm. so so his, some of his first theoretical work, well, the first theoretical work is in Italy. And then the second wave of sort of theoretical work happens when he's very engaged in this popular education, community-based organizing, popular education research stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the C factor comes out of those, those investigations and practices and working with groups and working with organizations and co-ops, et cetera, but not only co-ops at all. And then at some point, and I don't, I forget the timeline is actually in, I mean, you can make the time, reconstruct the timeline from that uh, preface or, the, or maybe my introduction to the first two uh, Solidarity Economy Roads, because I translated a lot of what was in something he had written, kind of describing his life's trajectory. But basically the gist of it is he didn't, he chose not to go into academia. I don't know if he could have even in Chile at that time, but mm -hmm. he chose not to. And so he instead has always been working with other people and creating these sort of parallel organizations. So they have something called New Civilization University um, was one of the, his projects. And so these are these kind of quasi, they're quasi institutional, like they're institutions, but they're kind of shoestring academic institutions very movement based and movement oriented but conducting themselves in a sort of academic manner mm -hmm. and publishing constantly you know doing all kinds of work and publishing books so his so it's a weird kind of marginal academic like involved in academic discussions involved in that world and yet on the margin on purpose like that was a very conscious choice of his to not go down that mm -hmm. part of it was because he has too many interests he can't be like he's he doesn't want to be stuck in one discipline so you know which is a very oh, yeah. to me it's a it's kind of refreshing it's a real 19th century phenomenon when when people weren't disciplined you know marx was not limited to any particular discipline right I, engels had no discipline none of these people learned that way and none of them worked that way Yes. No, I mean, it, it, and, and I mean, famously, even just the separation of political economy into political science and economics is yeah. a pretty recent phenomenon. And, yeah. uh, you know, this whole idea of interdisciplinary things is also quite new because we didn't have these disciplines before, you know, that yeah, they, there again, no the kind of like arbitrary concern. dividing up of, of yeah. reality into these Separate, so he has a uh, little bit of that quality. That's one of the things I like about him. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it always makes me cautious because I feel like, you know, people right. who really, really focus in a discipline do develop a highly systematic kind of body of knowledge that they're in, engaged with. Mm -hmm. You got to be a little careful when you're dealing with somebody who may be just yep. inventing stuff out of nothing, right? You have to be, you have to always ask yourself, is yeah. this for real? Um, <laughs> so and, yeah. yeah yeah 
Oh, for sure. I mean, and that's, you know, that is kind of the thing. And I, I, I think the internet, if it wasn't clear to people, those of us who are old enough to have, have been looking for information, trying to educate ourselves before the internet, it's definitely now clear that it's really easy to, you know, hear somebody who sounds like they know what they're talking about, about something that you don't know anything about, you're trying to learn. And you're like, oh, like I did this with ch with chess. I did not improve at chess for a couple of years of watching chess videos because huh. it turned out I was watching somebody who was bad at chess and <laughs> just sounded like they knew what they were talking about. That's and hilarious. so when I figured out like, oh, there's people with titles and you watch the guy that says I am in front of his name or GM, you know. Oh, that's, um, and yeah, so right? yeah you, you know you want to be cautious that. on some of these things like yeah, yeah it, because I, I like at some point in my life I, I discovered or I realized that like the way to be an expert or to be seen as an expert anyway all you gotta do is know more about whatever the topic is than anybody else in the room and it doesn't matter how much that is if they if everybody else knows nothing and you know one thing you're <laughs> the expert you now expert. right and people will you know and that's just kind of our human nature to go along with that so yeah you do want to be cautious however um yeah. i did a bachelor's degree in economics and i've continued right. you know my economic studies of like mainstream and heterodox economic sense i graduated in 04 and yeah. so i guess geez almost tw uh, 20 years now um, and what I discovered doing my economics, um, mm. degree, undergraduate degree that became clear to me and, and has only been confirmed since then is that mainstream neoclassical economics is complete hoko. Right. The, it, the, the, even and such simple things that we would think is like, oh, it makes intuitive sense. The law of something goes up, the demand for it goes down and vice versa. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, where is the data for that? Well, if you go and look for it, you'll find that there really isn't, yeah. you know, that the data doesn't actually back that up because there's, it's the actual economy is so complex, right? Yeah. There's a whole, <laughs> like the price of, uh, you know, bread, or rice yeah. or water goes up are you consuming that much less water right play into it right. and um and what i determined and you know at some point and i graduated with honors and i was getting a's in my classes it's not like i didn't understand right. what they were saying i just right. also understood that it was nonsense like for instance this is a huge problem yeah. economics is they modern economics has become very mathematized yeah and so it's, it's like if you can put it into a formula with a bunch of latin letters you know it looks very very impressive and you do your mathematical manipulations on it economics nowadays the problem yeah. is when you have a mathematical model you have to have very strong assumptions right like mm -hmm. and in economics those assumptions the assumptions that they make for their models are assumptions that don't exist in reality and not only don't but could not ever exist mm -hmm. in reality so, so my one kind of um like a good example of this is the efficient famous for which is, is is his like proof that capitalist markets um efficiently allocate capital right that they allocate capital to the most efficient use hmm. um and he proves this mathematically based on the assumption of perfect information there's lots of other assumptions oh, yeah, but perfect yeah. information yeah. right so every market yeah. participant every buyer and seller <laughs> of any commodity has all have exactly the same information yeah. right so not only does that not yeah exist in reality yeah it's not possible like that the laws of physics like thermodynamics would literally have yeah. to be violated in right. order for that to ever be the true and right. so what yeah. then does your mathematical proof mean at all? It literally right. is just nothing. So when I say like modern neoclassical economics yeah. is just hokum, this is what I'm yeah. talking about. They yeah. have mathematical models based on assumptions that like they don't understand that when you're modeling, you have different types of assumptions. You have like simplifying assumptions, mm -hmm. right? Because the world is complex. Like, so we're trying to model it. We're going to like 
you know, make some assumptions. We understand the implications, but there are also assumptions like that are called domain assumptions. Like if this assumption does not hold, we can't use this model, right? right. So if we're talking about like um, a model of, uh, you know, how long can I, um, I don't know, I'm trying to model how long I can live without food, right? right. Well, the assumption is that there's adequate oxygen, right? right. It's right. like, right. and if it's, it's like, oh, I'm trying to apply this model out in space right. now, and I don't have adequate oxygen. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, like that. It's domain assumption. Domain you assumption remember, not met. Therefore, you throw it out. And, and remember, economics remember the, is full of this. Is yeah. full of domain assumptions. You remember the cartoon? There was a New Yorker cartoon of two economists stranded on a desert island, and a, a <laughs> box of like canned goods comes up, and one of them goes, "Assume a can opener." Mm. <laughs> yeah we don't have it. exactly but, yes this is how we solve the problem yeah yes. we, we, so, we have for somebody problem. like Rosetto I, yeah. I mean so I think Rosetto is very well justified like somebody who's not like been brainwashed by the discipline right. needs to come in and and kind of take a very different look at it and so I really you know appreciate yeah. that he's doing that and uh it's like yeah if, if any discipline needs somebody from outside to come in it's definitely economics I think that's I think that is definitely true I mean when I when I first so I would I had no interest in or intention to study economics at all but somehow ended up at the new school in the graduate economics program so <laughs> But, you know, those things happen. Life is complicated. But really, it was because I wanted to learn. I wanted to study Marx really, really seriously. Mm -hmm. And Anwar Sheikh was there. And there were people. And you could study a two-year sequence of courses on capital. It was an amazing possibility. But, um, and and Sheikh has had just great riffs on perfect competition and all the assumptions involved <laughs> and market clearing and all this stuff. But um, one thing I... One thing that really struck me in those years when I was kind of dealing, mm -hmm. how, even in that very heterodox program, you're still kind of, it's engaged in discussion with economic theory, right, as such. And it was I, suddenly, I, I remember when I kind of realized like, oh, uh, if you, you, what you need to study is economic history. Bingo. Economic, <laughs> economic history is like completely rich completely relevant and fascinating and incredibly illuminating and like there's everything good about it and um none of the bs <laughs> like there's because it's a completely different concept it's like very different approach so economic history and then the other thing is is, is management literature some of that is bullshit, but some of it is actually super practical by people who are really trying to run this capitalist economy and therefore, they really, on the firm level, they're really struggling, grappling with understanding the dynamics. And so that's going to be more interesting and more useful in general than a kind right. of Right. But I mean, did you get concept. any of that kind of management stuff in a graduate economics program? Though? Yeah, no, I was say, no, that's in the no, B no, school. No, no, no. That's, a, that's no. all over the MBA and that's, program. Right. Yeah. And we used to be, I remember I was, you know, initially I had, I was very dismissive of that. I was like, oh my God, who's going to want to read that? That's just like the enemy's stuff, the master's mm -hmm. tools, all that. I don't want to deal with that. And then I remember I had a good friend who was a longtime socialist activist who was like, oh, no, 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 no. You really got to read Business Week. <laughs> it's like, this, this, you know, Business Week, The Economist, The Financial Times, these, there's oh, yeah. some really, really useful stuff going on there. And a yeah. lot of very experienced uh, lefty economists end up in mm -hmm. his publication because. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to know what's going on and be yeah. able to say coherent things about it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was, I remember kind of re being like, oh, that's that's sort of fascinating. But um, mm -hmm. so I, do, I think you're right. I don't think it's all hokum. I mean, I think it's like anything. It's like you can create an incredibly systematic, mathematized theory of blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and it will have its elements that are perfectly valid is just not going to answer some of the questions that you and i care about yeah well, at all and, coherently and in, the, in respect to those questions it is going to really be fundamentally incoherent and yeah. i think you're like the domain assumptions but you know that in modern economics there's been a constant huge labor at undoing a, at working against all those assumptions right mm -hmm. so econometrics is full of formulas for explaining imperfect competition 
It's not like they believe that they're not stuck in that old. Oh, who is it? Well, Marshall or whoever else kind of theory. Like it's, you know, some the elementary economics that's taught probably still is, but the economic theorists are kind of a little more complicated than that. I mean, read Paul Krugman and try to tell me that they're any more complicated than the like economics 101 stuff yeah, you get. It yeah, doesn't really know. seem like it. And that dude's a yeah. Nobel Prize winner. And, yeah. you know, I, it, so yeah, I, yeah I, I, I mean, I'm sure I don't want to like disparage everybody who works in economics, but, right. um, you know, there's a lot of nonsense there. I'm sorry. It's like you're not going to no. like drive well, me off that, I, but, you, you know, I, I, I'm uh, totally with you. and, um, I, you know, and even, yeah it, it, so and but what i think rather than just you know critiquing yeah. that which is and well I, i'll leave it here it, this I, I thought was funny and it was kind of like okay i'm patting myself on the back a bit maybe but when i was an undergrad one of like yeah. when I, I think i was a senior or something it was just like i got i was getting so frustrated with some of this like you know the macro you know yeah. economics i was being taught it just didn't like add up and uh you know i just like it seems like this whole economics discipline is really just apologetics for the status quo right that's all like it really is it's not it's like however yeah. we can just convince yeah. you that this is the best of all possible worlds and just deal yeah. with it yeah. like that's what we're doing and so fast forward to you know 20 years uh to like earlier this year i'm reading a paper from on inflation or something like that from one of the fed uh you know one of the fed research departments and this you know senior fed researcher in a footnote he has a little like asterisk and you look down at the bottom and he said it he has a footnote that says it could be the case that much of modern economic theory is merely meant as an apology for the status quo. Like he used <laughs> practically the same words I had, yeah, I had yeah. like come up with. And I was yeah. like, and he, of course he puts it in a footnote and yeah. you know, nobody read this stuff. And again, it's like the fe fed economists do the fed research departments. There's some good stuff that comes out of there. That's actually really radical and could be used like to right. educational purposes in a really good way. But of course like that, I don't know. So there are economists yeah. doing good stuff, um, but a lot of it is, I think, just that apologetics for the status quo. And and what yeah. we want to do, and what Rosetto is trying to do here, and I think we you know want to contribute to is is trying to think differently. And I, what I think is like economics needs to be rebuilt from the ground up, like yeah. just. And that's what you know. You said the economic history is the place to look, and 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 if you know, you're familiar with how the economics discipline has gone over the last 20 years. It was already happening and had happened when I was in school. Economic history courses are being removed from the curriculum entirely yeah. uh, in a lot of places and are taken, they're no longer, you know, required. It was a requirement for me, um, right. but they, you know, that was, I was like the last year that they were requiring economic history because you get those different ways of thinking about yeah. the economy um, that are, I think, dangerous. And so, you know, this is the one thing that I was thinking about this morning, you know, in terms of mm. this. OK, so the revenue, the surplus of a co-op, yeah. I think of I think in metaphors a lot. So this is my metaphor, the surplus and the, you know, the, the co-op generates or just the revenues and the surplus are like the blood of an organism. Right. They're like what mm. is they're the lifeblood. They're what keeps everything going. Right. It's not like the it's it's super fundamental right it's kind of like mm. making sure the nutrients get everywhere yeah. um and and that if that we should be thinking of a co-op as a worker co-op as an organism and that the members of that co-op are like organs in the organism right um and if the goal of an organism is to keep the organism alive and keep all the organs healthy and make sure that every all each of your organs in your body is getting adequate nutrition and oxygen and all that stuff mm. to keep it going. Um, <laughs> we need to th think like that. That is what I think how we should be thinking. So when I, mm. I often will come back to like needs based, like it's yeah. because of this um, that, you know, and um, you know, my understanding of human anatomy and physiology might be a little bit off, but, you know, I think what happens is when you sleep at night, um, all of your organs have a meeting and they decide how 
<laughs> distribute the resources that you've acquired for your body during the day, right? right? And everybody says what they need, and then you know the you know the blood makes it happen. And um, but you know if you <laughs> ever you know are your organs are meeting at night while you're sleeping, and like the brain pipes up and it's like you know. I'm super important to everything that goes on here. And, you know, I was thinking like the, you know, the um, intestine cells, you know, they get replaced all the time and they're kind of, you know, yeah. you know, it's gross. And I'm like, like, I think I, I need more of the blood. Like, I think I really deserve, pro that would be a problem. That would be a sickness that would cause the, the organism, your organism to not function as well. Yeah. And I yeah. think that a lot of our problems we run into is because, yeah is we're having these kind of like, really, if we're thinking about like, okay, we are an organism, we've created this thing that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And the, you know, point is for, for it to feed us. And, and, but, you know, it's, it's not this kind of, um, and, 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 and making decisions on resource distribution in terms of, you know, in the co-op surplus distribution, um, mm. in terms of need and not on the, you know, practical needs, like your body decides which organs get how much nutrients versus some kind of abstract conception of what is fair or not fair. Right. Mm. So... <laughs> because um, it man. seems there's a lot know, of, we, a lot of stuff come out, and I, of course i do this yeah right? I, I of course do this like you want to come up and be like well that's not fair that this person makes so much more and stuff like that and i end up you know, making arguments in terms of fairness right. whereas like i'm kind of thinking now like well it you know we can disagree about what is fair and not fair but there should be we should be able to agree a much more, I would think, on what is needed. What do you need? What do I need? Yeah. Is, you know, do we have enough to meet everybody's needs? If we meet, you know, can we, if we meet everybody's needs, how are we, you know, figuring that out? Um, so anyway. I, was... <laughs> I think, I mean, wow, there's a lot of issues in what you just said. I think. <laughs> you're like, you're insane. My God. No, they're good issues. They're all, but it's like several different things. So yeah. like one one just fun thing is the mm -hmm. whole guts versus brains thing. There's the speech, and I can't remember who it is. Famous Roman senator gives a speech during the rebellion of the plebs, I think. And he's and this is what he the metaphor he uses. Mm. You are the guts. You you people, you common people are the guts. We're the mm. brains. Right. Both of these things are needed. Mm -hmm. And that was and that was his argument, right? And it right. was very much an elitist argument, but yeah. it was a, a really effective bit of rhetoric, you know, and he really, he successfully put down the rebellion. But um, as I understand it, not, not uh -huh. as a specialist in that history at all. But anyway, so it's just kind of guts versus brains is a fun thing to think about. But, um, okay, there's a bunch of issues here. One is members. Mm -hmm. Is it correct to think of the surplus as only something where on, only the members are relevant to that? There's a question yeah, of no. community, community, the right. commons, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's always tricky. Like I've, I've seen a lot mm -hmm. of co-op 101 things where people will very confidently and happily say a co-op, the purpose of a co-op is to benefit its members. Mm -hmm. And people will say that with zero qualification ever. And I'm always like, well, no, you know, I mean, purpose of a co-op is whatever the people who are involved in it decide its purposes are, and those purposes could be movement building purposes. Those movement, and you could, there's a lot of stuff you could have as purposes that aren't strictly speaking economic benefit to the members. So it's more complicated than just the members right which you know i know you know that sure i mean but i mean there's also like you know it can become like a semantic thing yeah like well yes but you know if we the members of this co-op want to you know our our desire is to do some perform some benefit yeah. for the community then the co-op is you know just benefiting us by benefiting the community through our you know yeah the, light yeah. and self-interest kind of ways or whatever you i mean but 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 I think the point is, yeah, it's very valid. And well, 
I'll say a couple of things. One, I think actually the definition of co-op and, and should co-ops be about benefiting more than just the members? I think that's highly contested. And, yeah. you, and even though yeah. concern for community is in our principles, um, I don't know that everybody would agree what that needs to look like in practice, right? I, oh, I'm concerned totally. about lots of things that I do absolutely nothing about, yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. I have concern. Um, but so yeah. I, I do think it's an open yeah. question. And I know, especially like the people that I've, well, yeah. I have a couple of, of different kinds of like types of people, I guess, group types of groups of people I've, I've organized with or tried organizing with. Yeah. Um, and specifically when I've been organizing with people who are more like myself um, in terms of like lower income, um, manual labor, like kind of, you know, working class, whether you have a degree or not, like it's you, mm -hmm. we're in the bottom quintile, right, of the income distribution. Yeah. And usually on the yeah. younger side, but definitely not always. Um, I'm no longer, mm -hmm. obviously. So, um, but in those situations, like the a lot, and especially the kind of more lefty community minded people mm. that, you know, you end up trying to organize with, some of them have been very burned out and very kind of taken advantage of by the whole, like, you know, you're doing it for the cause thing and have, you know, feel like okay. I've been doing everything for the cause my whole life, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, okay. And so it's, and they're mm -hmm. very cognizant, especially the older people of like, it, this needs to benefit me directly in some way. Otherwise yeah. it's like, I'm, I, you know, there's lots of things I can give my, you know, my time to, to benefit. And so totally. keeping that in mind and, and, and in any, any, and with the younger folks, what I've noticed is like, sometimes that can be like, I have to remind them like, this needs to actually like actually benefit us personally in some way. Otherwise we're going to, we're going to like lose interest and not do it. Well, yeah. Like, it's great that we're benefiting other people and we should want to do that, yeah. but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that at some point you're going to want to see a paycheck yeah. out of this too. Right. Um, and this and so is navigating exactly, that kind of, um, that's exactly uh, Rosetto's argument, right? But that, that's, I think Rosetto is one of the most forceful advocates of that mm -hmm. position because he doesn't let you get away from it. He's like, he's like, yeah. you can't abstract from this. You can't like, this is yep. serious stuff. This is real. Some of that comes from the kind of personalist philosophy, the whole kind of, you know, value and importance of the individual person and their, you know, at that as a focus is not a mm -hmm. bad thing. It's not the same thing as individualism, yep. you know, the, the valuing of the person as opposed to, and not just the collective mm -hmm. is a really huge principle for people like him. But so I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in our chapter in cooperatives that work on community, Mm -hmm. um that was one of the chapters that was really written through the super collaborative process and so there's a ton of dialogue as we went through it and we were so dissatisfied right away from the term community like it was so important it's like such a difficult term to work with it so means mm -hmm. too many things it's used in so many ways etc right but also the whole concern for community concept is so lame and so feeble compared mm -hmm. to the concept of solidarity you know which is which is way more this sense of uh um c concern for community can be very external mm -hmm. there's those people over there wouldn't it be nice to do something nice for them so it fits in right. well with charity and all this kind of thing like, solidarity is more like the kind of that person's struggle is my struggle and we have to organize in such a way that both of these struggles get stronger Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, you know, not always people can use that term in a million ways too, but generally speaking, the associations mm -hmm. it has and the way it's been used are way more in that area. Yeah. So I think, I think that is a problem with the whole way in which the issue of community is termed. And there are plenty of great examples of people doing, doing really good work in this area. And then there are also plenty of examples of people using the most traditional concept and the lamest explanations <laughs> of what they're doing mm -hmm. but right I, so i'm not can i raise another issue though yeah, the, yeah, yeah. about need, and needs is really interesting and i think mm -hmm. in your like organic metaphor i think the way rosetta would think of it is that the operations of the cooperative enterprise are the are 
those are the needs that need to be met. Mm -hmm. The operating, the needs, the operational needs is what he's interested in. In other words, what does the cooperative firm need as an organism to operate? And it's made up of people and people are at the center of it. And it's, so it's not, we're not talking about capital's needs. We're talking mm -hmm. about the needs of labor essentially, right? Mm -hmm. But given that that's what we're about is, is the needs of labor. What are the operational principles or criteria that you would use for distributing resources? And that's what he's trying to figure out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, uh, and I, I mean, and that's interesting. It can, uh, so on the one hand, like, yes, I have just used the, the metaphor of a co-op as an organism. Um, on the other hand, I do think that just like any other type of organization, like um, a nonprofit organization or, yeah. um, you know, like GEO or like um, any type of business, any other type of business structure that it does not have agency itself, right? The co-op right. doesn't idea. like as such does not need anything. It's just like the co-op is a series right. of, you know, agreements that we have among each other. Um, we are the ones with nervous systems and with stomachs and with, you know, emotions, and we are the ones with needs. And, and that's what one thing I've really appreciated about Rosetto is his emphasis that you do not find the aspects of a business just floating freely out in the world. They always come attached to an actual individual, right? Yeah. Pretty much. And mm. so, and you have to take that into account. And so, um, but I, I do, so it's like, on the one hand, I, I want like, I would like, I guess, in like uh, for cooperators, for worker cooperators, it would make me happy if, and we all, oh, we're thinking of ourselves as part of an organism in our co-op. Um, and, and, and it's not as like, you know, people who are trying to compete for the same resources um, that we've, yeah. you know, managed to scrounge together. Um, but on the other hand, uh, so, I mean, and, and obviously... I don't know. I guess I always want to put like the the needs that are being met like in, in, in embodied people and not yeah. in like kind of these, you know, organizations that yes, have a real existence, but also kind of don't have real, they're not biological entities. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in, I mean, in trying to, yeah. But to, you wouldn't uh, like, I don't like, you wouldn't have it. It's like when you're so it's like we need we need this technical skill right we, we need this right. technical skill in our co-op right our co-op needs it and i need it because i right. need my co-op to exist so that i can you know keep benefiting yeah. from it um so i also need this technical skill in my co-op and yeah. if we need to you know so that, like that's a fact that's a practical matter the you know in the traditional economy of course like all problems can be solved with price you know, mm -hmm. you can't get it. You just pay more for it until it appears that at some point somebody will offer it to you for that price. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we do. But it's like, um, hmm. it's, <laughs> I, I, again, I guess I'm coming back to it, uh, like the other aspect of the like trying to like rethink things from the ground up is like in terms of person, the people involved in, the co-ops like hoping that the, um you know getting what quote unquote i'm worth or quote unquote i deserve right and that that you wow. know the, the, the people are not thinking in those terms it's not that they're thinking oh i don't deserve anything and i'm worthless it's like no i'm just not thinking in those terms i'm thinking what's oh, the work okay, that needs to be done what's yeah, the work yeah, that yeah. needs to be done and can i do that and how can i make it work yeah. and like being and being able to trust that okay in this co-op my needs are going to be taken care of and i know that this can happen i've experienced it and it was freaking mind-blowing and kind of life-changing at the ghana's intentional community um i was there you know visiting michael and uh he they had hired me to you know i was out doing for a geo meeting and i'll oh, stick around for a couple of weeks and paint you know couple of our yeah. buildings and um 
so I, you know, said, oh, yeah, it'll be great, you know, stay on the island, Staten Island for a while and hang out with the community. Um, unfortunately, uh, when, you know, the time that I got there, the guest room that they had available was kind of a little bit distant from the rest of the community. It was above one of their shops, like down on the commercial strip and a little bit noisy and, you know, and, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, I was a little bit disappointed, frankly, like when I'm like, oh, okay, this is my room. I mean, okay, all right, fine. You know, but having right. the attitude yeah. that I do, it's like, eh, you know, it's fine. I'll take one for the team. And, and, uh, you know, it's like, and if they have a better room, like I'm only going to be here for two weeks. So it's like, if they had a better room, they probably have like a, a full-time resident that should go in there or something. Right. Um, yeah. but I'm there for, I'm working for a couple of days and, uh, and Michael, you know, at dinner was, he's like, so how do you like your room? Is it all right with you? A little bit. And I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's like, you sure? It's not like maybe a little too far from the community, <laughs> like something a little closer, you know, I'm like, he's well, great. I mean, if you're, yeah, I mean, if you're asking, he's like, yeah, I mean, some of us were talking about it and we thought, you know, maybe you'd like to be closer and, you know, there's this room up here and it was, yeah, I like, I almost cried like yeah. right yeah. there. Cause it's like, I, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where other people were thinking about what I might need. Yeah. And I didn't. So I, it's like, I don't have to think about that. Yeah. I could just think about how can I serve the community and do what needs to be done. And I've got 80 other people making sure I'm going to get the, what I need. Right. And that is like the mindset right. that I think we really need to try to be coming from. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I tried yeah. in my economics, yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was a, yeah. an economics student to get my, one of my classes to do a, you know, just accept that like, okay, let's do a thought experiment where um, instead of everybody's like, you know, like everybody's spending their own income on themselves to fill their needs, like how we do it, like that in you, nobody would, you weren't allowed to spend any money on yourself. Like everybody gets their paycheck, but you're only allowed to spend money for other people. Like how right. would that change things? Oh, that's and, great. Yeah. And wouldn't that be better? Right. Like yeah. all of a sudden yeah. I would have all these people who can like spend money on, <laughs> right. And, and, uh, um, that's a but, totally great i love that yeah um, that's, a, like, that's a totally great that's a great activity to get people to think about that i love like, your story start. i mean i think that's like to me that's like that's the c factor piece right that's so in impressive is that here's all this compassion and care and consideration and consciousness and communicate like all these things happening and yeah. those are what and and think of the value in not just economic terms that that's creating like just the, how important that makes that place to you and makes your experience oh, yeah. how yeah, it enhances yeah. you and makes you better able to be and do you know the stuff that you want to and do. i'm going to do and, the uh, best possible work that i can do right <laughs> like oh, guaranteed yeah. i'm not oh, slacking of off yeah. like yeah there's no court you're not cutting corners when you're in that kind of like yeah 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 so that's no i think that's a great great and that's like, see, so that's like a great story. I think that's really good. And I think that that, there needs to be a place for that type of narrative, for that type of, because it, it, like it's related to these things, right? That we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's related to the stuff in Rosetta's book. It's not in Rosetta's book. That's not what he's doing. Right. And right. yet, no, no, no. wouldn't it be nice <laughs> to have these like, and that's like, I think that's one reason why the disco stuff has always appealed yeah. to me so much. It's like, here's a way to constantly remind yourself of these things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, keep this, these issues on the table. Yeah. And then in a very practical way, you know, make sure that surplus supports and propagates this stuff, keeps this going. You know, right. that's like, keeps you in that path. I think it's a, like, that's what's so brilliant about that. Yeah that sort yeah. of three-part concept i think is just amazing for that oh yeah no i mean i yeah. i oh i feel like i was such a debt of gratitude to people like rosetta and the disco folks and even like the mm. monetary uh, modern monetary theory people economics um you know even if it you know it's like like they're providing the foundation, right, to build upon. Right? We didn't get the neoclassical econ version of economics like overnight. It's this whole process of accretion. And yeah. so, okay, Rosetto and the, you know, uh, disco people and gorilla uh, translation might be laying down 
the foundation for us that we're going to, you know, other people, then it's incumbent upon the rest of us to build on and to keep, you know. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, the thing that'll be interesting in this book as it goes forward is like, I, I like this book because it's like, it feels like a gamble to me. It's like, it's sort of mm -hmm. like a risky venture because I get what he's trying to do. I like what he's trying to do. I like the fact that he's trying to do it. So up till now, it's really kind of an up till now thing. Up till now though, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm with him. Uh, I get what he's doing and I appreciate it. And I also think broadly speaking, it's right and useful. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have like, you know, I have questions like I, like we've talked about in the last time. Like I think yeah. that, you know, it's a political issue about how you determine things like wage with weights. Yeah. And, and you know, there's more to be done. But uh, yeah, it'll be fun, interesting to see where we end up in this conversation yeah. after uh, the next few chapters. Because he, yeah. he definitely, uh, he goes into the question of like weighted voting. And that's just. Yeah, yeah, that's I just, saw uh, that. Yeah, I'm like, that, that's like. That's Han, very interesting. Han o worms. Although, if we want to be real about things, and I've talked to plenty of, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate too much, but I've talked to more than one worker owner at a large worker co-op who has told me, and they're like different co-ops, that yes, technically we all have a vote. We technically yeah. we all have the same vote. <laughs> But yeah. in practice, when you have X hundreds of people, like a lot of it's more like rubber stamping. And I don't oh, know yeah. how it would work if like we actually got more serious about, like, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's like, OK, like, we, you know, the, the practicalities, I think, need to outweigh yeah. our our ideology on some level um you know well, but we also need to not yeah. totally lose sight of it just because it is easy well, so we need to reorganize the practicalities that's the other thing right it's like yeah, you yeah. don't you don't just need to ex like that's where division of labor is such a huge thing because sure when you have a division and of labor and that puts knowledge and stuff. understanding of the whole process together with access to resources and power and decision making Mm -hmm. then you're creating a really hard knot to break there and it, and and nobody's going to say yeah just let let that person in row 30 let in seat 33e fly the plane <laughs> like mm -hmm. no one's going to do that right but that's right. just because you've concentrated all that stuff in one person so it's yeah. like okay you're going to have to break that all apart and reorganize it if you're serious about democratizing power mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that is very disappointing to me. I said, I feel like so I rarely see people talking seriously about how to do that. And I always see people saying, let's just be realistic. Yep. So and so <laughs> knows more. So and so has more skills. So and so is better. So so let them make so they have more power and let's just be a realistic. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And mm -hmm. we should we should go with that. And I feel like that's like giving up point. too easy. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge concession that we don't need to make when right in front of us is a very simple like, a solution, which is like, oh, just don't have all that stuff concentrated in that one yeah. person. Yeah, cross training, you know, and yeah, uh, and that's or what, sociocracy like, is interesting or, to me in that way that was, because it, yeah, it was, you know, I mean, and which is its own, it's almost you could say like a type of weighted voting, and that if you are somebody who is directly involved in a particular process. You have a vote on that and other people don't right so it's like your vote has much more weight in particular instances that yeah. you are directly involved in um and then everybody you know so it's yeah there's uh there's lots of yeah there's other ways to to deal with it um and uh but you know the, it, there's hope and i think a lot of you know uh, there's a lot of value in just documenting uh, the different things that people have done like in our last on the live stream you mentioned about how the uh, organic gardens pays people more for moving rocks like doing yeah. like that heavy manual labor that's just hard on your body and it's nothing to do with like you needed a degree to do that or anything it's um it, which is actually kind of an inverse of what we normally would have yeah uh, which is like the hard manual labor usually gets paid less. I think how I think it should be, which is the harder your job is, the dirtier it is, the more dangerous it is, the more disrespect it gets you from like the in-laws, the more it should pay, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. To offset that. And we don't, we like load up all the no. negative stuff on the same oh, jobs yeah. and all the positive stuff on the other jobs. So it's like, 
that's yeah. what I would, you know, think we should be moving towards is co-ops in which um, the the janitors or the oh, I don't know the people doing the least the work that nobody wants to do or the yeah. least desirable work a pay bump because they're doing the least desirable work and checks or whatever um yeah i mean uh, like offsetting. Yeah. but yeah but it, but it's all possible once we start you know thinking in, in these kind of ways but um mm. but again who came up with that system of paying more for heavy manual labor is people who do manual labor for a living right you mean who paying more for that yeah yeah exactly it's people who have to do it and so they recognize it yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> totally totally yeah, true yeah yeah and that's why and, then, and we have like yeah. we have the great example there is mindy too who does uh cross training right with uh, yeah. in their co-ops that's one of their like major things which yeah and i i think we we underestimate people too you know it's like if you if you're not expected to ever learn how to do the book business and so the person who does know how to do the bookkeeping for your business is always going to be able to say oh i'm the only one with these skills right yeah um, and then because of competition you get you people really latch on to that yeah. anything anything you have that gives you any sort of advantage in the labor market you're going to grab onto and be like i have this skill God damn it. <laughs> so, and you don't, and I'm not going to make sure you don't get it because I need it. But once you're in that competitive mindset, you're like, exactly. you know, it's super destructive mm -hmm. for any, as with everybody knows, right? Like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. That's where uh, Sorry to Bother You is a good movie. Mm -hmm. Right. All those kind of horrible psychological dynamics in the oh yeah <laughs> and yeah it makes you wonder like what would i do right would you yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know would you take the job you know doing the the big time uh sales or would you ah it's so creepy uh, no you're, you're working for the man one way or another <laughs> yeah yeah well there's more we can talk about for sure I have For a story sure. I'll tell you, remind me when we get into the democracy thing, there's a fun story from Eroski, the huge supermarket chain in Mondragon, around kind of how democracy yeah. thing. There's some fun anecdotes. Cool. But, uh, well, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for taking the time. Uh, yeah. No, yes. I, I, I